All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today at Grand Rounds. I am uh, very happy to be introducing Dr. Nada Ikukashian. So I will read her bio first, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, kind of how I've known Dr. Ikukashian. So Dr. Natalie Kukashian is a psychiatrist and assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. After receiving her MD from Tulane University, Dr. Kukashian completed her internship and residency in psychiatry at the Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. Uh, she also completed a fellowship at the Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research. Her current research focus is on the feasibility and efficacy of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy for mood, addictive, and eating disorders. She also studies adverse effects and drug interactions involving psychedelics. In her clinical practice, Dr. Gokassian works at the Johns Hopkins Bayview Community Psychiatry Program, serving patients with co-occurring mental illness and addictive disorders. So a little bit about um, kind of our personal journey. So I had the pleasure and honor of training alongside Dr. Kukasian in our residency program. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that she is an excellent clinician. And also she has a mind, the drive and the vision to um, really revolutionary, revolutionize our field in research. And right now she's doing some of the cutting edge research uh, in a very hot topic in our field. And I suspect that we'll you know, hear from her through her publications for many years to come. Uh, so without further ado, uh, here's Dr. Gukasian. Thank you, Dr. Joe, for those very kind words. And thank you for inviting me to come and talk with your group. Um, it's, uh, I'm really excited to be here and to share with everyone today a little bit more about um, the latest in psychedelic assisted therapy research. Um, so I'm gonna skip ahead off of this little slide here, I think it'll show up again at the end. Uh, um, disclosures, I don't have any relationships with any for-profit commercial entities. So here's the, the title of my talk. And yeah, as you guys heard, I'm, uh, I, I work over at the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research, which was um, essentially born in 2019. It's been up and running for a couple of years now. We have um, the good fortune of having uh, some funding to continue this, this kind of research for the next several years at least. Um, so our learning objectives today, I want to talk a little bit today about the basic mechanisms of um, psychedelics, including the psychological effects and some of the mechanisms associated with the subjective side of what happens when people take psychedelics. Uh, we'll talk about the standard treatment model that's currently used in psychedelic assisted therapy, um, including some of the vulnerabilities of that model for doing research. Um, and lastly, we'll talk about the, the current level of evidence for efficacy in major depressive disorder and, and a few words on other conditions as well. So, sorry, my PowerPoint's been a little weird. I gave, I gave another talk earlier this week and it was a little finicky. So, uh, Pardon me if that happens again. So, um, so here we go. So uh, the language used to refer to these drugs has evolved over time. Right now, the, the term that's in, in favor is psychedelic. It comes from the Greek roots psyche and delos, uh, meaning mind manifesting. Um, in medical settings, they're often called hallucinogens. Um, but that term doesn't really fully convey the spectrum of drug effects that we see with these drugs, especially not those that are thought to contribute to therapeutic effects. Um, in other places, you might see them referred to as entheogens. Um, entheos translates to being uh, full of God or inspired or possessed. And the term entheogen can be used to describe drugs um, that cause the, experience, uh, the user to experience feelings of inspiration, often in a religious or spiritual manner. And so psychedelics can produce acute changes in mood, perception, and cognition. Um, and subjective effects that people report are commonly interpreted as being very personally meaningful and spiritually significant. Um, there, there are some somatic effects associated with the use of psychedelics. Um, and when we, uh, th this class of drugs, essentially, it's bound by this mechanism of action, the, the 5 ht 2 a receptor agonism or partial agonism includes um, psilocybin, LSD, mescaline, um, DMT. Um, and it's important to note that technically 
MDMA and ketamine are actually not considered psychedelics, even though they're often um, sort of talked about in the same breath. Um, they work by different mechanisms. Uh, they sort of, you know, MDMA by indirect serotonergic action um, and ketamine through um, an MDA receptor antagonism. So, um, you know, why are people excited about psychedelics? And the short answer is that uh, a lot of studies are showing that in just one or two drug administrations, um, given in a supportive setting, have been found to produce benefits in mood and positive behavior change that lasts for months and in some cases years, which is really exciting and very different from some of the existing therapies um, that we have available in psychiatry. Importantly, though, all these drugs here are still considered Schedule I in the United States under the Controlled Substances Act, uh, which means that the U.S. government doesn't really recognize them as having any real therapeutic or medical benefit at this time. So that's, I think, rapidly going to change. Um, so today I'll, be, I'll focus primarily on psilocybin, as this has been the, the subject of study for a lot of the modern wave of uh, essentially the contemporary research with psychedelics. Um, it's metabolized by the liver to produce the active metabolite psilocin. So psilocybin itself doesn't actually have um, any effects in the brain. It's really psilocin that does the work. And it has a agonism or partial agonism at a number of serotonin receptor subtypes. Usually the effects come on within about um, 15 minutes and can last up to six hours. And here you can see kind of the similarity between um, psilocin and serotonin, which is uh, can explain why it has efficacy of those receptors. So um, before we get going, launching off into talking about um, mechanisms here, so I'll, I'll be talking about there, you know, essentially there are two broad categories of explanation that have been studied and that I'll review today. Um, those pertaining to what's happening at the biological level. So with receptors, you know, brain network changes, et cetera. And then there's the, the other half of explanations that relate to what a person experiences subjectively um, and psychological changes that happen in the short and the long term. And so while our understanding of the biological pro uh, processes driving acute subjective effects have changed and improved a lot over the last um, couple of decades, the, the mechanisms of short and long-term therapeutic effects remain less clear. So we can kind of, at this point, fairly um, accurately tell you what's going on at, at the receptor level when psilocybin or psilocin um, binds, but we can't really explain how exactly that links up with the therapeutic benefits that we're seeing. Um, so um, uh, we also don't really know whether the subjective experience of the acute drug state is necessary for therapeutic efficacy or if the subjective effects are mere epiphenomenon of some neurobiological process that's driving the actual clinical improvement. Um, here's a, a figure from um, a, a paper written by my colleagues. You know, so we basically know that, yeah, we give somebody a psychedelic, they experience all these very interesting subjective effects. They feel and see things, um, you know, have all sorts of somatic experiences. And, and eventually this leads to all sorts of therapeutic effects. What we don't know is whether um, if you block sort of any subjective awareness of that, whether that would lead to the same sort of uh, benefits or not. Um, and the last thing to note is that clinical trials done with psychedelics have involved quite a lot of uh, psychotherapy. And that's sometimes not emphasized as much, but probably has um, real significance when it comes to figuring out what is actually driving the benefit. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so in terms of the, what we know about biological mechanisms of action here, um, so what we do know is that for acute behavioral effects to happen, um, we need to have essentially 5-HT2A receptor binding in a specific subset of uh, uh, neurons in the brain, which are in the cortical layer 5 pyramidal neurons. Um, 5-HT2A is expressed in a lot of different places, but it seems that these particular neurons have a, a very special role um, in that. And so when psilocin agonizes these kinds of receptors in all these different cells, there's widespread internalization of the receptor across all sorts of different cell types, both inhibitory and excitatory cells. Um, and a small subset of the excitatory cells that are activated this way go on to actually produce most of the downstream effects that we see with psychedelics. So interestingly, 
it's not really clear why this specific tiny subset is something like 5% or less of cells that are activated by psilocin um, go on to do this. Um, and we also know that downstream glutamatergic signaling um, is also necessary for the action of psychedelics. So when these are blocked, this, this effectively blocks the, the action of psychedelics. And when we think about um, how depression plays into this, we know uh, we're still figuring out exactly how psychedelics can cause benefit for depression. But the, you know, one possibility is that it might be due to the direct effects of psychedelics at the 5-HT2A receptors or other kinds of serotonin receptors. Um, downstream glutamate signaling, like we just mentioned, might also produce antidepressant effects of its own in a matter of kind of similar to uh, what we see with ketamine. And lastly, it's possible that um, there's a, a kind of a synergistic effect. So it's not just that like, you know, we have the nice glutamatergic signaling that we do with ketamine, but we also have this um, changes with serotonergic function and together um, it's possible that those are um, contributing to a lot more change than just one or the other would alone. Um, so this is a figure that you might have seen before. It's very commonly shown in a lot of uh, media and a lot of other talks. Um, this is just to, to comment on what we know about what happens in um, brain networks when we give a person psychedelics. So on the left here, well, th these are both um, MRI connectograms. Um, which shows communication between different brain regions or hubs. And so on the left is placebo, on the right is um, acute psilocybin administration. So maybe like an hour or two after you give somebody psilocybin. Um, the density of these connections represents the, um, the strength of the connection. So these thicker lines are a stronger connection than these thinner lines. Um, and points adjacent on this circle represent points that are kind of in similar geographic areas in the brain. So as you could see, um, after you give somebody psilocybin, there's all sorts of long range um, connections that happen that, that aren't normally there in a, in a resting state when someone is uh, taking placebo. Um, essentially, there's markedly increased intercommunity crosstalk after psilocybin. Um, and it's important to know that these are acute changes. So these, all these changes don't persist after um, the acute period of drug effects. And we're still kind of figuring out um, what happens in brain network uh, effects in the long term. So um, it, with respect to depression, um, you know, major depressive disorder is associated with higher than average levels of connectivity in the default mode network. Um, the default mode network is a, it's like a large scale brain network that's active during unfocused awareness. Um, also during like self-referential thought, it includes the medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior singular uh, cortex and the angular gyrus. Um, and so people with depression have higher activity in this, in this network. And this has demonstrated to normalize after treatment with other therapeutic modalities. A lot of research with um, DMN, sort of function after psychedelics, but the, in, the, in summary, I think we can say that it's a little hard to interpret exactly what it all means because there's a lot of conflicting findings. Um, a lot of the research has been done in healthy participants and there are kind of um, you know, acute decreases followed by subacute increases in function. And so it's really not exactly easy to interpret. Um, and in addition, a lot of other drugs cause DMN disruptions, including alcohol and DMA. And so it's not something that's really um, specific to psychedelics per se. Um, this is a, it's from a paper done by my um, study written by my colleague, Fred Barrett, that looked at uh, some of the longer term changes that we see in um, brain activity after psychedelics. So he gave um, 12 healthy participants psilocybin and he uh, ran them through the scanner before, one week after, and one month after psilocybin. Um, and what he found was that one week after psilocybin, which is these teal bars here, there was, uh, a, well, first of all, their negative affect reduced, so their mood was a little bit better. And their amygdala response, which is uh, indicated here in both of these two top panels, their amygdala response to facial affect stimuli were, were reduced. So, um, and this was to all kinds of faces, to angry, fearful, happy, sad, positive and negative faces, um, the amygdala just did not light up as much when it was shown these kinds of faces in the scanner. Um, 
And additionally, there was um, responses to emotionally conflicting stimuli were increased in the amygdala. I don't know if that's actually indicated in, in either of these panels here, but um, and you could see that one month after um, things essentially return to normal to baseline. Um, however, the, the changes in mood at that point are still there. So even though the change in amygdala function kind of gets closer to what we saw initially, um, people are still feeling generally better. Um, and finally, just in terms of biological mechanisms of action, there's some evidence that uh, classic psychedelics can result in structural and functional neuroplasticity. Um, and there's a paper that will be coming out soon but written by my colleague, um, Gold Dolan, that will get, um, I think it'll make some waves, but essentially it sort of says that um, psychedelics can reopen periods of uh, critical periods of learning, which might explain um, a lot. <laughs> so and it's, it's neuroplasticity and critical period reopening are sometimes thought of as kind of similar. Um, so it's also in the same vein here. Um, so we do know that serotonin 2A agonism um, in the prefrontal cortex increases the brain-derived neurotrophic factor expression, uh, which might be related to changes in neuroplasticity. And we also know that psychedelics have anti-inflammatory effects that can facilitate stabilization of the brain in, in its theoretically renewed healthy state. Um, and this might be done via TNF-alpha, um, media, mediated by TNF-alpha reduced changes in inflammation. Um, so, so that was, we're, we're finished with kind of the biological stuff of, of what happens when you give a, a person psilocybin. Um, and there's a whole other realm of research that's been done about um, what happens when, uh, psychologically, when you give a person dr uh, these drugs. Um, and, and naturally, this, to me, this part's also quite exciting, you know, but there's a, lot, a little bit more controversy here as well. But so far that, you know, there've been growing numbers of studies that have identified um, areas in which um, subjective or psychological effects might be mediating therapeutic response. And these include um, changes in psychological insights. A lot of people report that um, they come to some sort of psychological insight about their relationships or themselves or their history um, in a way that's, um, novel to them, even though sometimes maybe they've recognized something on an intellectual level, it just kind of hits a little bit more deeply or viscerally during the psychedelic experience in a way that that sort of brings the message home. Um, there have also been increases in uh, the openness trait of uh, personality in some studies that's been durable, like can last, you know, can, is present months later after psilocybin. Um, some studies have found that uh, there are changes in psychological flexibility, and that might mediate um, improvements in mental health. Um, another kind of domain that's uh, of interest to a lot of people is um, factors associated with changes in mindfulness or ability to access mindful states, which kind of um, links it back with a little, some of the kind of more spiritual or mystical themes. Um, and you know, lastly, there's the mystical or the peak experience kinds of effects, um, which we'll talk just uh, more about in just a little bit. But, but this is kind of a contentious term in some uh, circles, you know, as it sort of implies something supernatural or, um, you know, not very scientific, but, um, but it is a measurable effect. Uh, so when we use the term mystical experience, what we mean is a, it's a constellation of empirically measured phenomenological dimensions that don't imply any kinds of supernatural levels of explanation. Um, and these dimensions are common to some types of non-drug-induced peak spiritual experiences. Um, there's a paper that's sort of uh, in production right now or getting ready to be published um, from our group where uh, in a study where, where my mentor, Dr. Griffiths, actually gave psilocybin to a variety of religious professionals um, to see what kinds of effects they have and to see if it's sort of similar to other kinds of you know, religious or spiritual experiences that people might have had. Um, but, but in short, the, uh, the domains of this experience as measured by a scale that we often use called the mystical experience questionnaire um, rates people on domains of how much they felt a sense of unity, deeply felt positive mood, transcendence of space or time, 
um, ineffability, sense of sacredness or reverence in their experience. Um, and so what we've seen so far is that people um, who report higher levels of this mystical experience um, as measured by the MEQ or the mystical experience questionnaire um, have essentially like better outcomes and that this relationship is dose dependent such that at higher doses of psilocybin people report higher levels of MEQ and the higher the MEQ is the more likely they are to have long-term positive results. And here's a, here's a figure from um, another sort of well-known paper. This is from McLean et al. Um, and Dr. McLean showed that there are, uh, there can be long-term changes in levels of openness and personality, and that these are more likely to be present when there has been a complete mystical experience, which meant that the person had like a 60% or greater um, uh, score on the MEQ, basically. Um, so, the, you know, if you had a, myst a complete mystical experience, you're also more likely to have this enduring change in your temperament, which is pretty remarkable. Um, all right, so just a, a, a few words on um, kind of the history of, of, you know, to sort of orient us in time here. Um, the first wave of psychedelic research happened in the 50s to the 70s, um, very early on kind of the, the, th the thought was that maybe these were psychonomimetic agents, meaning that they were able to mimic the effects of psychosis or to sort of, they might allow people to get, gain access to uh, the state of mind of somebody with schizophrenia or schizophrenia spectrum disorder. And gradually it became clear as people gave these drugs more and more that there might've been some therapeutic potential. Um, but unfortunately the, the, there were some, you know, there were promising early findings, but they were quite weakened by poorly designed studies, essentially. It was a lot of just like tons of case reports and not very many um, rigorously performed studies. Um, and right before anybody could correct that, research kind of went dormant and funding went dormant due to safety concerns uh, related to non-medical use, essentially people just using psychedelics out in the wild. And that was around 1970, uh, in the early 1970s when that was kind of shut down. And so things didn't really go anywhere for about three decades until the early 2000s, which is when we um, consider the second wave to start. Um, and this started in, in large part in, in our group of way before I got there, but um, in the early 2000s where they studied healthy individuals and then gradually had been moving into more clinical populations. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty of like what all the latest research shows, I just wanted to also orient you all to what actually happens in the session and what this treatment functionally ends up looking like um, for people who enter our trials. So first people have to go through a pretty rigorous medical and psychological screening. Um, probably the key things that we're looking for are whether there's any evidence of like a psychotic disorder or any kind of bipolar spectrum disorder. Um, or any family history of that. Um, and patients must be medically well. Any history of anything like epilepsy is a, is a contraindication um, or a sort of unstable cardiac condition of any kind. Um, patients also have to be free of any serotonergic drugs. So that's kind of an important point. I think, you know, if this does make it to the clinic, it does require that patients have to be tapered off of their medic medication and stay off for four and a half lives before um, receiving any kind of psilocybin. And the reason for that is um, it varies. You know, there's a lot of research showing by a lot of actually, so not that much that we're actually working on a study now, a survey study uh, to interrogate this a little bit, but it's, uh, it's known that people who are currently on antidepressants, specifically SSRIs actually have a dampened uh, level of subjective effects. So it actually kind of blunts the effects of psychedelics. Um, and there are a couple of drugs that can actually um, potentiate the effects and some to a dangerous level. We just published a review of online experience reports where we found that people taking lithium had something like a 40% chance of reporting having a seizure. And so lithium is a hard contraindication for receiving psychedelics. Um, so guides and facilitators, um, have a critical role in all phases of treatment. So after somebody screens in, they meet two people, usually sometimes it's a male-female dyad, sometimes it could be um, two women. Um, 
and they sit with them through the entire study, basically, including the preparation, which lasts about uh, usually it's about six to eight hours of contact between the two study facilitators and the participant. Um, they take that time essentially to get to know the participant, to build some rapport, to build a sense of comfort and safety. Um, in some cases, there can be a specific therapeutic modality used, but it's not always the case. And sometimes it's just kind of unstructured, or, you know, supportive kind of style, but not really any explicit therapeutic you know, orientation. Um, and an overview of what to expect on the drug administration days. So here is our uh, session room. Here's Bill Richards on the right, who used to do this work back in the 70s when it was still legal. Um, and Mary Cosimano um, and some mysterious no-named participant. Um, so they, they sort of, this is the default position that somebody's in during the, the session day. They have eye shades and headphones and the headphones are playing um, a selection of music that's been the same for at least a decade now, but um, has changed a little bit per the study. Um, and during the session day, the, the goal is to have a kind of non-directive approach. So the two guides are there for support, um, but they're not directing the experience really. They're not sort of you know, telling the participant to think about this or that or, or anything like that. The, the, the point of them being there is to offer a sense of safety, like if they should, if the participant should be really distressed, that the guides are, are there to provide some, some comfort and reassurance. Um, the session lasts all day, um, and it can be kind of a tiring day. And this is probably, you know, if you think about the cost of this kind of treatment, the, the real cost comes down to the study staff and sort of paying for people to have access to two trained clinicians all day long. Um, and finally, after, after the session day, we have a couple of follow-up or integration meetings, the number of which varies by study. Um, usually it's the next day and then one week, and there may be others built in as well. Uh, the, review, the, the point of all this is to sort of go over what happened on the session day and talk about any changes that people have experienced since then. The goal is to understand and incorporate any insights that were obtained into the, from the experience into their daily sort of living uh, into their daily lives. Um, and gradually they sort of, you know, in our studies, we just want to see how people are doing. And so we've, we followed people up to about 12 months and they, we sort of gradually taper the um, frequency of visits here. All right, so this point we'll move into um, an overview of some of the research and I might have to, hopefully I have time to fit everything and I might sort of speed through some of these things. So. Um, some of the earlier evidence for efficacy in depression came from um, a handful of studies that were looking at the effects of psilocybin in people who had um, terminal cancer and other kinds of terminal illness. And there were three, three basic ones, um, the biggest of which was done at our, uh, at our site. And it was back in 2016. And among 51 people, um, there was a significant drop in their grid hand D scores. So the grid hand D score of about 17 is the cutoff for severe. And so these people were indeed um, quite depressed and many of them uh, essentially went to a level of remission. Um, let's see. There was a similar study um, by our colleagues at NYU and they also recently published a um, three to five year follow-up study of the participants who were still living. Um, as you can see, their level of depression was a little bit lower, mostly in the mild range. Um, but many of them who were still alive continued to have uh, vast reductions in their level of depression. Um, and so, you know, obviously one critique of all that was that people who are suffering from end-stage cancer are not the same as people with you know, true quote unquote major depressive disorder. Um, and that maybe they would respond in the same way. And so Carrot Harris um, and his colleagues over at Imperial College London published this first study in the modern era of psilocybin for people with treatment resistant depression. So these are folks who had failed 
at least two classes of antidepressants, and they were given um, two oral doses of psilocybin. The first one was 10 milligrams, the second was 25. 25 is kind of the standard moderate to high dose that we, we consider to be a, a full dose. Um, and so at one week, 67% uh, of patients were in remission, and at three months, 42% were still in remission, and 58% had a, a response, so basically a 50% reduction in their depression scores or more. Um, the, the, this group likes to use the QIDS, the Quick Inventory of, of Depression um, Severity, and as you can see, they, their effect sizes were pretty robust throughout the three-month follow-up period. The same group published a sort of long -term, longer term follow-up um, study. This, so this was, and this was in a slightly larger group. So this initial one was really only 12 people. And so they later published uh, results on 19 people and they published it up to six months. Um, and as you can see, their results or, or their, their depression um, improvement stayed fairly stable um, compared to the three month time point. They were still getting effect sizes of about 1.6, um, which is pretty high. Um, you know, in a lot of studies that we see where um, a depression therapy is being tried out, you know, we might expect an effect size on the order of like 0.2 to 0.4 and 0.7 if it's really large. Um, but here we're, we're able to see significant effect sizes. Um, our group completed a, um, another study in this area that was published in 2020 in JAMA Psychiatry. Um, the, the improvement above the previous study here was that we had a waitlist control condition, right? Because everybody in the other study was just open label, they all received the same treatment. So here we we're actually able to compare and um, control for anything like just spontaneous improvement of depression that happens over time for people. So we looked at 24 participants. Um, they were all quite depressed. You know, again, their grid handy scores as well, well into the severe range of depression. Um, and they too had quite robust effect sizes at one in four weeks with a very high rate of um, clinical response and remission um, at that time period. This is from um, a paper that we have that's currently in review that's looking at that same study, but um, collapsing the two groups and seeing what happens to them 12 months out. And as you can see, the effect sizes actually remain um, very high, even at one year, which is very, very exciting. Um, so you might see this hopefully soon. Apparently the reviewers are looking at it now. Um, you, you guys might have heard of this study, which came out more recently, um, again, from our colleagues overseas in the UK. Um, this was a very, this, this study had a very interesting design. It was a trial of psilocybin versus Lexapro or acetalopram for depression. Um, and they took 59 people and split them into two groups. One group received, um, so everybody got like two doses of either psilocybin or a very low dose of psilocybin, like one milligram, which shouldn't produce any subjective effects. Um, and then six, six weeks of daily medication. Um, and part of the group received placebo and part of the group received Lexapro and Escitalopram at that time. So the first group got two doses of, two, uh, two doses of psilocybin at a high to moderate level, and then six weeks of placebo. So if, in effect, they were getting only psilocybin and the other group got two very low doses of psilocybin, essentially the placebo level, and then six weeks of Lexapro. Um, so they were in effect the Lexapro group. Um, and they had a lot of outcome measures. Um, again, this group really likes the QIDS. Um, and unfortunately for them, the QIDS was the only measure um, that actually failed to show a significant difference between the two groups. As you can see, there's a clear trend favoring psilocybin. Um, but there, there really isn't much significant difference between the two groups. And in, in, in effect, they might have just been underpowered to show this. And if you look at their you know, supplementary data, I, I believe almost every single one of their many other measures of depression showed a significant difference between the escitalopram group and the psilocybin group. So it was kind of just unlucky, unfortunately. Um, and the New England Journal, uh, because they're kind of strict, did not really allow them to comment very much on the um, 
secondary measures uh, that they found. So, um, and we'll come back to this a little bit later. Um, so I wanted to, to touch a little bit on some of the problems associated with doing psychedelic assisted therapy research. Um, primarily that runs, runs down to, boils down to having a hard time implementing actual gold standard level research of like randomized placebo controlled trials, which is what we're used to for many other pharmacotherapy studies. Um, a big problem is that the subject of drug effects lead to unblinding for both the participants and the staff. Um, the effects are usually just so intense that like it's, it's usually quite obvious to people um, what group they're in. Though I have been surprised in the past, we're, we're running a study now which, which has a true placebo condition. And in some cases it really wasn't clear, surprisingly to, to us or to the participant. Um, but the problem associated with this is essentially in, in part a nocebo effect, um, especially in studies without a crossover condition, a participant who has depression um, might become further demoralized by by the you know the feeling that they received a, you know an ineffective placebo condition when they could have gotten this very promising new drug, and so this can actually um, decrease their their mood even further. And then there's also the problem of allegiance effects, meaning that um, essentially if you have study staff who are really excited about one therapy in particular. Um, they may, you know, consciously or unconsciously sort of play up the effects of the treatment condition that they're in favor of and sort of maybe even heighten the negative effects of something like some placebo condition. Um, and psychotherapy likely makes uh, an independent contribution to symptom improvement. Um, and even in cases where there's no explicit psychotherapeutic modality used, um, and I'll explain this further in just a minute. So there have been um, many creative attempts to circumvent the placebo problem in psychedelic research, um, though no approach is really a perfect solution. And a lot of these have the problem of unblinding and the related nocebo effects. Um, essentially any condition that doesn't have overt psychotropic effects um, is prone to nocebo effects, um, which might essentially inflate the effect sizes that we see. Um, so this is true of you know, the weightless control, which is what we used in our weightless control depression study published in 2020. This is true of true placebo, right? Because a person might sort of feel like they're, they're getting nothing. It's also true of very low dose classic psychedelics, which also usually feel like the person is getting nothing. Um, other studies have used a non-psychotropic active placebo. So that includes things like um, niacin uh, or zinc sulfate. Zinc can cause a little bit of nausea. Niacin usually causes a bit of flushing or sort of like the physical effects, but nothing really um, psychologically in any way. Um, and then the other problem that we run into is with other kinds of comparator conditions like um, other psychotropic drugs that have alternative mechanisms. And there have been a couple of studies that have looked at comparing psilocybin to um, methylphenidate, for example, or to dextromethorphan, which is um, a dissociative drug. And they're also not really perfect <laughs> conditions because they can um, convincingly, uh, well, essentially they have their own antidepressant properties. There've been a couple of studies that show that, yeah, stuff like methylphenidate can actually lower depression, um, as can dextromethorphan. There's actually some studies ongoing right now of using uh, DXM in a manner similar to psilocybin. Um, so uh, here's a tweet from my colleague, Matt. Johnson, <laughs> which I, I think he really puts this very uh, well. And he says essentially that psychedelic therapy is more psychotherapy than most pharma companies and neuroscientists know how to deal with, and more pharmacology than most psychotherapists know how to deal with. Um, and we'll talk about some, a couple of interesting things here. But in short, it, you know, in typical drug studies, um, the goal is to demonstrate a uh, significant benefit of the drug compared to placebo, which is why factors that are known to boost placebo response are actively minimized. Um, however, in um, 
psychedelic assisted therapy, we're instructed to do a lot of the, the very things that are known to boost placebo response uh, under the guise that this is just good therapeutic practice and that this is actually necessary for safety and efficacy. Um, and in short, in many ways, clinical trials with psychedelics tend to resemble psychotherapy studies much more than a typical pharma study. Um, and, and we know that, that sort of minimizing these factors that improve placebo response is especially important in conditions where, where we're known to have a large positive response to placebo. And this includes pain studies and don't you know, depression studies as well. Um, and we'll talk about how these factors are kind of rife in psychedelic assisted therapy research. Um, this, this was a great study. It was done in 2008 by Kapchuk et al. Um, so he essentially did, uh, he and his colleagues did a stepwise manipulation of factors that are known to enhance the placebo response. Um, he took a couple hundred people who had IBS and he put them into one of three arms. Um, one group went into the waiting list condition. So they just had you know, people calling to check in every now and then. Um, the other group received sham acupuncture and kind of a limited patient practitioner relationship. Um, and the other group received sham acupuncture plus an augmented or essentially kind of a warm practitioner patient relationship. Uh, so here is what um, Capcheck instructed the, the people providing the sham acupuncture with the augmented style. Um, so he instructed the practitioners to have a warm, friendly manner, to engage in active listening, to demonstrate a lot of empathy, um, to communicate confidence and positive expectation in the treatment when they're talking to patients about what to expect. Uh, and from time to time to take 20 seconds of thoughtful silence while feeling the pulse, pondering the treatment plan. And in terms of the content, um, you know, they engaged in extended conversation about the history of symptoms. They elicited the patient's own explanations of the cause or the meaning of what they're experiencing. Um, and they discussed the impact that all this has had on other areas of their life. Um, and as you might have caught on by now, these are kind of factors that we would associate with just good psychotherapy, plain old good psychotherapy, right? So, so part of the group got this kind of nice warm relationship with sham acupuncture and the other group got this limited relationship in which the provider was a little bit terse, kind of said like, I know what you need, let me just do this and I'll get out of the room um, and didn't do all these nice things. And predictably, uh, the people in the augmented condition did better across the board. So it's the last column in all these panels here. Um, in terms of like adequate relief, you know, the waiting list group had 30% improvement compared to the over 60% in this augmented group. And it's kind of a stepwise um, improvement here. Um, so um, in addition to depression, um, Psychedelic assisted therapy has shown efficacy for a lot of other conditions. And it's been a little bit, um, might be a little bit puzzling to people why that is, right? So it's been studied now for all kinds of addictive disorders, for um, smoking, there's a study that's ongoing for cocaine use, for alcohol use disorder, um, a couple of studies in OCD, um, and studies are planned for, we're ongoing for a bunch of other conditions too which might raise some questions about why psychedelics should have efficacy across so many kinds of conditions. Um, and to my knowledge, the only other kind of treatment that can do that, um, it has that kind of flexibility is actually psychotherapy. Um, and the next question is then can we, you know, should we just attribute all of the benefit that we get from psychedelics to psychotherapy? Um, probably not, given what we know about like a lot of the biological effects that we just talked about. Um, but there's a striking overlap between the standard model of psychedelic assisted treatment with what are called common factors in psychotherapy. Um, and so um, in an effort to understand why um, many different kinds of psychotherapy all seem to have some efficacy, um, a gentleman named Jerome Frank set out on this long expedition to survey almost every kind of psychotherapy and found essentially that there are four common factors that um, 
that sort of any good psychotherapy or effective psychotherapy has. Um, and a, a large body of research since that time, this was initially published back in the 60s with a couple of you know, subsequent updated volumes, but a large body of research um, in psychotherapy since that time has kind of confirmed that it is actually these, these kinds of factors rather than the specific bells or whistles of any given psychotherapy that does the heavy lifting of treatment. Um, in fact, like, there have been some dismantling studies where they kind of like pick apart psychotherapy and say, well, what if we give like, you know, uh, psychoanalytic or psychodynamic style psychotherapy, but we, um, but we actually take away all the material about psychodynamic stuff and really just make it about the relationship. And so they made this like pared down version of psychotherapy that's truly just like, essentially resembles supportive psychotherapy. And that was as effective as, you know, specialized, you know, psychoanalytic or dynamic or CBT therapy. Um, and so these factors essentially all show up in spades with psychedelic assisted therapy, right? So we have the emotionally charged relationship or, you know, um, as, as a provider in this setting, it's been kind of interesting, right? Because I'm used to sitting down with a patient for like at most, maybe like an hour and a half if I'm lucky. Um, Whereas in the prep for a psychedelic assisted treatment, somebody I'm sitting with them for like three to four hours at a time on two occasions. Um, and it leads to kind of a very intense dynamic that is that I haven't really uh, run into or experienced in my typical practice setting. And then we have this weird little, you know, kind of idiosyncratic room that we provide the treatment in that it kind of resembles a living room. It has couches and art, it looks like, you know, maybe a room that you might have in your own home. Um, which is very different from our typical clinic setting um, or something you would see in the hospital. And we certainly have, you know, a rationale or conceptual scheme or myth. And in the modern era, a lot of this has relied on, you know, the, the era of science, you know, psychedelic science. And what does that mean for um, why, these, why these things are so powerful, right? So for a lot of people, it plays on this kind of um, scientific or empirical uh, the, you know, essentially the power that science has in our society. And then finally, obviously, we have a very potent <laughs> ritual or procedure, perhaps more so than anywhere um, in, in, uh, in any other kind of psychotherapy, right? Um, so again, these, these common factors do most of the heavy lifting in many different kinds of psychotherapy. And they show up in spades in psychedelic assisted therapy. And so right now, if we come back to this most recent um, study, right, by our colleagues who compared six weeks of Lexapro plus this kind of sham ceremony or ritual with, with psilocybin. It didn't really have any psilocybin. We see that it's actually quite effective. The sham psilocybin is quite effective at producing some therapeutic benefit. This is their mean change in QIDS score. Um, it's not quite as, as high compared to psilocybin, um, but it really is, you know, it's significant. It looks like it's maybe even more than half of the benefit that somebody could expect to receive. And again, at this point, they're getting really just one milligram of psilocybin, which is you know, 1 25th of what we believe is the active uh, or sufficient dose. And they haven't gotten any Lexapro here at all yet. And so um, that I think maybe is even, can be, can be seen as a measure of the power of that kind of ritual or ceremony and the relationship that's sort of built in the preparation for it. Um, yeah, there's some improvement over time. Um, at this point, we start to get some Lexapro. Maybe there's you know, barely even a point of improvement. We also know that we wouldn't really necessarily expect to, expect to see much change in this period of time either. Um, which brings us to a somewhat uncomfortable question about <clears throat> whether psychotherapy is equivalent to placebo or whether it's a type of placebo. Um, here's a bit of a hot take by um, Kirsch, who's done a lot of research in this field and his colleagues that highlights that this is actually more of a semantic problem that arises from the medical roots of the term placebo. So he writes, um, the placebo effect in medicine is produced by factors other than the physical properties of the treatment of the drug, essentially. But when we think of psychotherapy, um, the effect of psychotherapy is, by definition of the term psychotherapy, <laughs> produced by something other than the physical properties of the treatment. 
Um, therefore, if we're looking at the medical definition of placebo, using the, uh, the effects of psychotherapy are ipso facto placebo effects, and psychotherapy is ipso facto placebo. Uh, and yet, we know that psychotherapy is indeed effective um, for the treatment of many, many health issues. And rather than thinking of um, common factors or psychotherapy as placebo, um, Kirsch and colleagues suggest that we understand them as the active psychological ingredients that are necessary for active or adequate treatment, basically. Um, so yeah, it's not this like pejorative, horrible thing. It's truly just like the technique of psychotherapy and, and the requirements of that to actually produce therapy. Um, some caveats to this slightly pessimistic take um, are that um, antidepressant effects have been demonstrated in animal models of depression, suggesting that at least some of the uh, some role of the biological mechanism, and in fact, usually a pretty um, statistically significant one. So obviously, we don't think of animals as having the uh, capacity to really fully engage in any kind of psychotherapeutic process, and yet they're still showing some benefit here. Um, we also know that the effect sizes are much larger than what we typically see in any kinds of psychotherapy trials for depression. Um, usually we, we see effect sizes in the you know, low to moderate range of 0.2 to 0.7. I think 0.7 might even be considered a strong effect um, compared to Cohen's D of two for psilocybin-assisted treatment. Essentially, this refers to the number of um, standard deviations of difference between the means of the treatment group and the placebo group. Um, so two standard deviations of difference and improvement for depression scores. Um, I think this is an important point here is that even if, psych even if psychedelics work merely by enhancing expectancy or by um, you know, being like an extra punchy and powerful um, ritual, this is still very likely an incredibly powerful clinical tool. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, whether the subjective effects of psychedelics are necessary for therapeutic efficacy remains a matter of debate. I'm on the side personally of the fact that it does make a difference, right? Because I've seen that um, a lot of um, the improvement uh, that a person reports can be, at least in their um, rational sort of understanding or packaging of it when they when they describe it, has to do with some of the subjective things that they have seen. For example, and somebody I worked with very recently um, who was very depressed for at least 25 years, had multiple hospitalizations, has early responded to any kind of medication, sort of came out um, and said, you know, like had the experience and has, hasn't been depressed at all since then, which is a first for um, this person's entire adult life, that essentially what they experienced was like a deep understanding that um, only the relationships that they have in their life are important and everything else that they were worrying about um, was essentially uh, not worth <laughs> not worth fretting over. Um, and maybe that, again, is just some sort of like rational process that we have to kind of explain this huge change in um, a person's conscious awareness, but that's kind of how, how this person explained it. So looking ahead, um, two entities are running phase two to three studies comparing psilocybin to placebo for depression. That includes USONA, who we're working with um, as a site for phase two. We're gonna be doing like a preliminary um, data analysis, I believe in October or November, um, and then potentially rolling into phase three. Compass is the other group, they're a for-profit group compared to USONA, which is not for-profit. Um, they're looking at psilocybin specifically for treatment-resistant depression. They also have some studies ongoing for bipolar II depression, which is a little bit more controversial because we know that um, psilocybin can precipitate mania in some people. Um, and there's also a lot of earlier phase research going on in academic settings, including for um, tobacco use disorder, um, alcohol use disorder, cocaine, uh, opioids. Uh, there's actually some big news from our group uh, if you, just a few days ago, our colleague Matt Johnson got awarded what has been the uh, first NIH grant that's been awarded to study the therapeutic effects of psilocybin um, since <laughs> for as long as we can th think of, and especially since the, the research on this stopped. So I think we're really entering a new era of this kind of um, 
of research on this kind of treatment and it's, it bodes very well for the future of um, psychedelics in the clinic. Um, PTSD eating disorders, this is one of the, the studies that's been a focus of mine. Um, pain disorders, neurological disorders. Um, the other important point is that both of these groups here have received breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA, meaning that the FDA has sort of made an agreement or announcement that they're going to work closely to facilitate um, any of the administrative processes that are associated with you know, getting this, this, their, these studies moving. So they were sort of agreed to, to work with us essentially. Um, so it's all very exciting, the short summary. Uh, so here's just a summary of some of the, the main points here. Um, serotonin 2A agonism is uh, central to the effects of psychedelics and we're still learning about exactly what is behind the longer term um, therapeutic effects that we're seeing. Um, the research is currently in phase two and three. We can expect, I think, you know, the studies for psilocybin to wrap up um, at the earliest, I think, you know, three years from now. I think we're more reasonable at an estimate might be four, maybe even five years. Um, and following that, it would actually take, it's not just that we need to do the research, it's that there would have to be a legislative action to reschedule um, psilocybin from schedule one to two or, or, or something lower. Um, and finally, the, uh, just to remember that there's a substantial psychotherapy component, um, and this kind of poses some challenges for conducting placebo-controlled research um, in a way that's a little bit unique in our uh, mental health research field. So um, thank you for your attention. Here's just a, a number of my colleagues at our rapidly growing center who have contributed to a lot of this work. Um, and I would happily take some questions now. All right, Dr. Bukasi, thank you. That was fascinating. Um, so I think that we have uh, Andrew, who, if you want to unmute yourself to ask Dr. Bukasi a question, I see that you wanted to ask a question in the chat. Sure. Uh, hi, Dr. Bukasi, and thank you for all the work you've been doing. Um, so my question is about eating disorders. Um, I think it's like easy to see how there are existential themes in a lot of those patients. Um, and so it makes like intuitive sense that psilocybin would be useful. Yeah. Um, but I've also heard some attendings talk about it as having like a delusional process that is, you know, somewhat psychotic in nature because there's a fixed false belief about, um, you know, the way they look and so forth. Um, and it strikes me as like one of the few diseases where there is that overlap. Um, and, you know, a lot of people talk about um, psychedelics as being like very risky for any kind of person with a psychotic history, but this is like, you know, it's something concrete and Mm -hmm. psilocybin tends to be good for relaxing concrete ideas. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the overlap in those things? Yeah, I think and we ran into this question at least a couple of times while screening people for um, our anorexia study where I remember one person who um, endorsed, you know, concerns that people were tampering with their food when they would be out in public and, um, you know, we, we sort of talked in detail about this with our expert consultants over on our eating disorders program. Um, I think in general, um, anorexia bears a lot of phenomenological resemblance. It's, it's a little bit closer to something like OCD than it is to psychosis, where there is this, as you say, like over control of um, like, you know, like hyperactivated sort of, you know, loops in our brain circuitry, kind of like similar to what we see with like severe depression in the, in the DMN. Um, and that was the thought, but yeah, we were worried about it. It's like, well, how, you know, this doesn't seem like that, that, you know, like this might be at the level of like a delusional process, what should we do? Um, and so far I don't, I, I can't say that we've had, um, like for that, that person, for example, has actually done very well, um, and has loosened some of those beliefs. Um, and so it's not, um, uh, yeah, we haven't we haven't run into that particular problem with with eating disorders. I think the, the problem that's arise much more commonly is that um, 
unlike something like depression or even like something like an addiction where the the, the change might be rapid, right? Like, you know, for depression, you, know, you get the drug and maybe the next day you're like all better. Um, in order to, to recover from something like anorexia nervosa, you need to have a sustained change in your behavior. Um, and so it, that actually involves a lot of hard work. And so the and sustained levels of hard work in order to reach the point where you're actually in recovery, right? It's not like, like you're gonna gain enough weight to be at a normal BMI overnight. And so that's been a that's been a challenge is sort of like mobilizing enough support for people in our study to to make those changes. Um, and in, in that general, respect, yeah. In that respect, it kind of reminds me of like the addiction population. Um, and yeah. I'm curious about whether you see it resembling more, you know, the mood versus the addiction. Yeah. If I can make a false dichotomy. Well, but, it, and it even, I would say like, so far we've had like not even the levels of success of some of our addiction studies, like in smoking where, you know, in a small group, albeit a small group was like maybe like, I think 12 to 16 people had very high rates of smoking cessation was something like 60, 80% that sustained through 12 to 14 months. Um, even that is a little bit more like, you know, putting down the cigarette and not buying any more cigarettes is still simpler than like, doing the thing that you're most terrified of every single day, three times a day, plus snacks, you know, just like eating and all food. Um, yeah. And so for a lot of people, it's, you know, who have gotten better, it's looked like that they had rearranged some of their priorities a little bit and realized that like, yeah, you know, my health is a, is a priority. I can see how this is um, maybe a maladaptive way to cope with something, um, but it's not been quite a, a slam dunk in the way that our depression or even some of our addiction studies have been so far. Do you, I mean, I don't know if you're allowed to talk about it, but is it more of like a kind of steady improvement as opposed to sort of dramatic change and then sustaining? Yeah, in fact, like, you know, you can even expect and this is true of even regular eating disorders treatment, like anxiety and depression to go up in the very early phases of treatment because you're you're sort of jumping head first into those things that cause a lot of anxiety. Um, and so we do see kind of things like that, but what we see is that in the longer term, again, when people do get better, it's usually like a few months out after the psilocybin. It's not like an immediate thing where they're like, immediately jumping into changing your eating necessarily, though some people have. Um, and so it's, it's just kind of all over the place and <laughs> we, still, we still need to recruit more people. So yeah, if anyone here has any patients with anorexia nervosa um, who might be a fit for this study, uh, you should direct them to our website, hopkinspsychedelic.org slash anorexia or just hopkinspsychedelic.org. There's a link on the, on the front page under research. Great question, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks. Um, so uh, another question that uh, someone had was, can you talk a little bit more about the process of having uh, two simultaneous staff members working with a patient uh, at the same time? Kind of how did that conception come into being? Uh, why, why the two instead of just yeah. one person with the person for a longer time? Uh, well, I think the main thing is you can't leave the participant alone or the patient alone. And event, like you can't just sit in a room for eight hours. And at some point, you're going to have to take a break, use the restroom, eat your food. Um, and also, I think like in the very early days, it's been sort of less emphasized. Um, it might even have kind of like psychodynamic-ish roots that you, know, you have like especially when you have like a male-female dyad, which is a requirement in some studies that it's kind of like, oh, maybe you have a maternal figure and a paternal figure and you can, you know, maybe having that one-two punch of two transference <laughs> figures would, would be better than just one. Um, but, and, and it's sort of like the, the kinds of people we put in those roles vary. So for a lot of studies, especially in the early 2000s when we were doing this, mostly with healthy people, um, the two facilitators would be like, one of them was an actual clinician and the other one was maybe like a research coordinator assistant. And it would just like be there and not necessarily be like a trained therapist per se, but would, would be there to chime in from time to time and just sort of express, you know, worth and, and be a supportive presence. Um, 
but it uh, it varies. Like sometimes, like I have been in a dynamic where it's like me and another like highly trained clinician, <laughs> and it's been sometimes felt a little weird. It's like almost like dueling therapists if you're not on the same page of what to do. Um, so it's it's definitely a little strange, and um, the, the, that's a big question right now as to like what this will look like if and when it's in clinics, and what the requirements will be the training requirements or sort of the educational requirements for either of the two guides. So right now the FDA is really pushing for, well, one person should be a doctoral level clinician and the other person, okay, fine. You know, initially they wanted a master's trained clinician, but they're like, okay, maybe now just a bachelor's would be fine. Just something to have in the room. Um, and it's really, it, uh, it's been sort of an ongoing conversation between the FDA and, um, and the entities doing the research that includes like MAPS, which is the group doing the MDMA research of PTSD, who's actually kind of furthest along. Um, and they've spent millions of dollars in legal fees trying to get the FDA to tone down their, their supposed requirements for who should be in the room and what kind of training they should have. Uh, because that's going to be the biggest barrier to actually getting this into clinics and to getting insurance companies to pay for it. Um, I suspect that when it first comes out, insurance companies are going to want like nothing to do with it. Why would they? It's sort of a new, um, not very well established treatment. Um, but it could have huge cost savings, right? If this is like, you know, if the alternative is like weekly psychotherapy for years and like repeated, you know, one after the other medication trials with limited efficacy versus something that's like quick and highly effective over a long period of time, then the answer is kind of clear, but I think it's gonna to have to be around for a little bit before payers really uh, pay up. Right. Well, yeah. thank you. That was actually a follow-up question someone uh, had. So I think if you're answering that, the, the barrier seems like right now it's gonna, well, you know, it really is important to see what it looks like in the clinic kind of, yeah. you know, in actual practice for yeah. all across the country, across the world. Um, okay, any other questions of it by anyone in chat before I kind of ask another one here from my email? Okay, so the, another question we have here is that, uh, what do you think are the implications of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy on the way psychiatric diseases are categorized and conceptualized? So I think you touched a little bit on this about Kind of the overlap between effective psychotherapy and um, psychedelic assisted treatments and there seems to be a lot of flexibility um, yeah. so i guess what are your thoughts on kind of moving forward and how we think about you know psychiatric diseases in general um I think there's a lot of uh, hype <laughs> shall we say about like you know what you know there's about like what psychedelics mean um, for mental health, for just like our understanding of what consciousness is, that's sort of like a kind of a, you know, an area of buzz, right? We're like, oh yeah, psychedelics are going to unlock the mystery of like consciousness and what it is. I, I kind of doubt that that will be the case, um, but it may have like some significant implications for how we categorize and conceptualize um, mental illness, right? Because, um, you know, maybe this does point to some, you um, like trans diagnostic mechanism that's common to many, many different kinds of mental illness. And maybe we'll find that this is, um, and we are kind of finding it, right, that this is better for some kinds of illnesses than, than for others. Um, I don't know that it's gonna like change the DSM overnight necessarily. I know Dr. Jell, you and I trained at a place that is kind of, uh, maybe poo poos the DSM, shall we say, right? Like, and it's because it's really um, kind of a field guide. It's sort of a list of you know, here's a bunch of different categories of you know uh, phenotypes of mental illness that you might encounter, but it doesn't really speak to etiologies very much in most cases. Um, and maybe we'll we'll sort of find some way to um, to link all these conditions and entities in a, in a different or novel way. Um, but on the other hand, I don't know, I'm just, I'm cautiously optimistic, right? Cause we've been in the, you know, like the era of the brain was like the 1990s and we thought we were gonna like, you know, answer this question with all of our wonderful brain scanning studies. And we've gotten essentially nowhere. 
right? Um, so maybe we'll maybe we'll make some steps in that uh, area of inquiry, but um, it might take some time. Yeah. Right. Um, any other questions for Dr. Gukasvi? Okay. Well, I think uh, that's it for us. Thank you, Dr. Gukasvi. That was wonderful, and thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. This is a pleasure. And yes. uh, yeah.